So here we are with the VCE 2020 chemistry exam and we're going to do a walkthrough with it. So our student number will be chem Esode. Um, and let's get stuck straight into it, shall we? Okay, so first question um, on our 2020 VCE chemistry exam. Glycogen breaks down into, well, um, does it break into glycerol? No, that's fats and oils. Amino acids, that's proteins. Triglycerides, they are fats. So therefore, it's going to be monosaccharides because glycogen is a group, or it's a um, polymer of gluco, gluco, uh, is a polymer of glucose. So therefore, when you break it down, you are forming monosaccharides. Glycogen is the store of glucose in our bodies or animal um, carbohydrates, basically animal starch, they like to call it. Question two, using a large sample size in an experiment increases what? Large sample size, if you want to have um, basically reliability, um, that's what you'll use a large sample size. Large sample sizes, you're probably not going to get precision because you're going to have results all over the place, but you want to have a large sample size, and if you get consistent results, that means you've got reliability. Validity, not so much. A method can is valid based upon the fact that what you're doing is controlling all the other variables. So validity is more about controlling variables than anything else, um, or doing the right method, choosing the right indicator in a titration and so on and so forth. Using the same conditions in HPLC would make something a valid um, chromatography experiment. Um, uncertainty, not so much as well. Reliability is what large sample sizes is for. Again, large sample sizes in conjunction with having similar results. That's what reliability is about. Um, I would like to see um, something about similar results in that question as well, but let's just roll with reliability for question two. Moving on to question three, which um, is here, okay? A diagram of an electrolytic, or sorry, electrochemical cell is shown below. This wouldn't be electrolytic. This is um, by looks like a salt bridge here. But we've got a direction of electron flow. What does that mean? That means the electrons are flowing towards the cathode here. So we can label that. Which of the following gives the correct combination of electrode in the oxidation half cell and electrolyte in the reduction half cell? So being the cathode here, this is reduction. That means this is oxidation over this side. So therefore, my electrode in my oxidation half cell would be Q. So therefore, we can cross off A and B. And then my electrolyte in my reduction half cell would be R. So it's going to be C for question three, which is really good. Main thing here is identify one thing you can label, which is electrons flowing towards the cathode. So therefore, this is my reduction. Or reduction is gaining electrons. So you can see electrons are being gained here. So therefore, that's reduction. Another way of knowing that. Question four. What is the IUPAC name for the molecule shown above? Here it is. So IUPAC is about looking for the longest chain, first of all. One, two, three, four, five. So it's going to be pent something. So therefore, prop and prop, we can cross those two out. And let's have a look at what the difference is here. We've got three hydroxy pentan one aim and one amino pentan three ol. So we've got an hydroxyl group and we've got an amino group. Sorry, an, yeah, amino group. Now, I know that anything with oxygen takes priority in naming, so therefore it's going to be a pentanol, which suggests it's going to be this here. Um, and one amino, this is off the first carbon, and then three ol is here. I don't love that numbering system, um, because I would have thought the thing that takes priority would have the lower number, so that could be two. But um, regardless, it's definitely going to be D, because my oxygens take priority in naming. So anything with oxygen is higher in the food chain of our um, functional groups. So therefore, D is our answer. Moving on to question five, the metabolic, 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 um, so the metabolic process that produces water, produces water being a condensation reaction or something that makes water happen, um, is what? Digestion of fats, no, that will be a hydrolysis reaction. Cellular respiration is actually going to produce water. Hydrolysis of starch, no, hydrolysis requires water, so it's not going to be that. And the breakdown of protein into amino acids, that again is a hydrolysis reaction, so it's not going to be D. And it's going to be cellular respiration, remember, um, that is what happens when you run around. Um, so 
you are going to be having um, C6, H12, O6 plus O2 forming, um, CO2 plus H2O. And we have the devil's number, so it's 666 six, six for the balancing of cellular respiration. And you're producing six waters um, for every glucose in that one. Question six. Which of the following pairs of statements is correct for both electrolysis cells and galvanic cells? So electrolysis cells and galvanic cells. Let's have a look. In electrolysis cells, are both electrodes always inert? No, you might have a reaction occurring with an electrode, so that's not right. Electrical energy is converted into chemical energy. Um, that's true there. Chemical energy is converted into electrical energy. That's not right. Um, the products are dependent on the half cell components. That makes sense to me because, um, well, clearly, you're, what you're producing depends on what's in it. Um, so let's have a look at galvanic cells. So we don't care about this. We don't care about this. So the voltage of the cell is independent of electrolyte concentration. That doesn't make any sense to me. The electrochemical series that we have, like, that looks kind of like this, all right? Um, basically, your voltage that you produce is dependent on where these things are in the electrochemical series. And this is based around standard laboratory conditions, which includes one molar concentrations. So if you deviate from standard laboratory conditions, these guys are going to move around. So therefore, you are going to produce different voltages for different concentrations. So the answer must be D, but let's have a look. Chemical energy is converted into electrical energy, and that is definitely true because it's a galvanic cell. So galvanic cells are like batteries, so therefore this is both true for electrolysis for this one and galvanic cells for this one. Let's move into question seven. Question seven. How many structural isomers have the molecular, molecular formula C3H6BCL uh, isomers? Fun times. Now, what's great about this is um, they've given you half a page with nothing on it to actually play around with these. So I've got three carbons, three carbons. One, two, three. I'm going to draw out a whole bunch of these, and then I'm just basically put my um, BRs and CLs somewhere along the line. So let's start off with just doing this. Now, um, I've got, let's call um, BR, B, and CL, A. All right, so therefore, they could be off the same carbon. That's one. I could have the A here and the B here. I could have the A here and the B here. So these are th that's definitely three there. All right, what about if I had the A here? I could then have uh, my B here. I could have the A here. I could have the B here of the same one. There, so that's going to be making, how many is that? It's going to be five now. Now, what if I move my A over to here? Well, that's going to be the same as if my A was on the first one here. So my answer here is going to be five. Simply by drawing out what I've got and then just testing out and being systematic in my approach, starting with them both on the same carbon and then moving one across to see what would happen. And when I've taken that one to all my different carbons, I can then move the next one, A, in one and then do the same thing. All right. So that is my response to question seven. Moving on to question eight, which of the following is the most correct statement about fuel cells and secondary cells? Fuel cells can be recharged like secondary cells. That is not really true. You can refuel a fuel cell, but it's not like recharging. You're not putting electricity into a fuel cell. You're basically just topping up the fuel. So that's not right. Fuel cells produce thermal energy, whereas secondary cells, no. Fuel cells produce electricity. They don't produce thermal energy. All right. Um, they produce some thermal energy probably in the way that they work, but that's not the designated energy that they want to produce. The anode in a fuel cell is positive, whereas the anode in a... No, that's not right. Anode is negative in a fuel cell, first of all, because it's a galvanic cell. All right, so therefore, that's not right. Means D's right. Fuel cells deliver a constant voltage during their operation, whereas secondary cells reduce voltage as they discharge. That makes sense to me, partly because we've got um, something along the lines of this one here. Remember this one? Um, because we have electrical, no, yes, yeah, standard level conditions, all right? 
cell voltage is independent of electrolyte concentration. No, cell voltage is dependent on electrical con concentration. So therefore, as we use our secondary cell, okay, as our concentration decreases, so does the voltage, or the voltage just changes. We don't know if it decreases. It just is different. Probably does decrease, but that's the idea there. D is the answer for question eight. Uh, two more questions and um, this video will be up and I'll start looking at some other ones to do when I get a chance anyway. Uh, question nine and 10 deal with this and we're looking at calorimetry um, and we've got this graph. Let's go straight to the question. Uh, what is the calibration factor for this calorimeter? Alrighty, so calibration factor equals energy divided by delta T. My energy in this case was looks like it was given by electricity, so therefore that's gonna be 2.7 amps times, hang on, no it's not, wait a second, equals VIT, that's good, yep. Yeah. So it is 2.7 amps times my voltage of 5.4. Now times, what's my time? It started at 60 seconds. It went for 180 seconds, so times 180. So that energy is going to be, where is my trusty calculator when I need it? Um, let's find that. Here it is. 2.7 times 5.4 times 180 equals 222,000, sorry, 2,600, sorry, 2,624.4. That's my energy divided by my temperature change. What's my temperature change? It starts at 18, all right, and goes to 21.2, 21.2, so therefore it's gonna be divided by 3.2. So that answer there, divided by 3.2 gives me 820. So therefore the answer will be B. 820 joules per degree Celsius. Making sure you know that VIT equals joules. Not so much important in this question because you only have joules going on there, but if you did this in a short answer question, you need to know what unit your calculations give you. Question 10. This type of calorimeter has, I'm back again, this type of calorimeter, well, I've taken out, has no heat loss because I can see the heat loss here. I can see the fact that the temperature is starting to go down again, which suggests it's cooling down. So therefore heat is getting lost from the actual thing itself. Can be used for bomb calorimetries. And I've said no to that one as well because I read through it again and it said it's a solution calorimeter, which is basically a glorified beaker. A bomb calorimeter needs to have a combustion chamber in it. So therefore you cannot combust something in a solution calorimeter, it just doesn't work. This is for reactions of um, solutions like acid-base reactions or dis sol dissolution reactions where you're dissolving something and looking for temperature change. C, requires electrical calibration in order to determine the calibration factor. Do we actually require that? No, you should know from your um, lessons in chemistry, the fact that you can calibrate something using any form of energy possible. So therefore, if you had a reaction that you knew the delta H for, you could calibrate this um, using a chemical um, process as well, because then by using a set amount of chemical that you know the delta H for, you could use that to work out how much energy you applied. Basically, this idea of a calibration factor, this energy can come from anything you need it to. So it's not that, that leaves D. Measures energy changes that can be measured in a bomb calorimeter. Now that would be correct because as I said before, your bomb calorimeter looks pretty much the same as this, but it's got a combustion chamber. Now that doesn't mean that you need to use the combustion chamber. You could simply do your solution calorimetry in the water that surrounds that as well. So D is the most likely response for question 10. So hopefully that helps. I'm going to, well, hopefully get some more of these questions done at some stage when I'm not too busy.